Welcome, AFS Artistic Director Rick Lincoln. I don't really have an intro tonight, I'm sorry. That was the whole point. Lars is totally fucking. But um, <laughs> anyway, I can't believe this is over. It's our last uh, film for the 80 to 83 uh, section of this 80s fest that might go for a few years. We don't know yet. The future is uncertain. But uh, out of the blue, you know, we've had a lot of love fests um, over the weeks. Tonight is going to be a Dennis Hopper love fest because he deserves it. Dennis Hopper died four years ago tomorrow, believe it or not. May 29th, only because it's my daughter's birthday. But uh, we're still assessing that whirlwind career that, that he had in all facets. Um, I can't think of, he's kind of perfect for an 80s series, because I can't think of anyone who started the 80s lower and ended higher. A lot of this 80s is people who struggled through the 80s, the great ones laying low by Hollywood. But uh, damn it, if Hopper, well, I guess you couldn't start much lower than where he started. And this film, uh, what does it tell you? This film was made, it was officially 1980, but no one saw this film until about 83. Um, it started playing, I mean, that speaks to how little interested anyone was in anything Dennis Hopper, but also how kind of splotchy independent films were distributed at that point. It wasn't such a commodity. There wasn't the specialty theaters to that degree the way it is now. So it was a bad time on a lot of fronts. He got this film made in Canada and, uh, you know, Hopper had been exiled. He was probably on his second Hollywood, you know, exile. <laughs> at that point, uh, the first one came in the late 50s, pretty quick, pretty quick for, for Dennis. You know, as we all know, uh, as a 17 year old, you know, Hopper's from, like born in Dodge City from Kansas. He's a good old boy, you know, but uh, as a teenager, old school Hollywood, you know, he goes out to Hollywood, he's on contract at Warner Brothers. He's in Rebel Without a Cause. He leaves the set, he goes to the set of Giant, where he's in that with his best buddy, James Dean, who he idolizes. Hopper's a teenager. Dean's probably five or six years older. Um, Dean obviously dies. Hopper stays in the industry, but has this attitude. Famous story. He's doing the film with Hathaway. What is it? Hell, Texas? What? A Western. And the director and actor see it different ways. Um, just keep going. Another take. Another take. Henry, ha you know, Hathaway, the old Hollywood director is like, do it again. Hopper's like, we're doing it my way. Do it again. The takes, the afternoon keeps going, keeps going. Take 80, take, and they're just at this standoff. People were hearing about it around Hollywood as it was going on. <laughs> <laughs> and the day ends with Hopper fired. And that was it. I think he was out of Hollywood and he was a young man then. He goes to New York. Uh, Hopper's so interesting, you know. I think he gets little credit because he, he did so much. He's a brilliant photographer. I don't know if you've seen his, his work. Uh, he's a painter. He's such an artist, you know, such an amazing guy. And, uh, you know, has one of the biggest pop art collections. He was right there at the beginning. If you look at the art scene from the late 50s all the way to his death, Hopper's, Hopper's everywhere. You know, just, just an amazing force. But he's one of the guys who starts acting in indie films. You know, he's, he's in films, he's in war, he's hanging out with Warhol, he's, he's everywhere, you know? And he works his way back, Hathaway, hires him back, Sons of Katie Elder, 65. He, he's back in Hollywood a little bit, working for Corman as always, doing the trip and that. Does Easy Rider, could you have a bigger hit? Could there be a bigger zeitgeist film in history? You know, than Easy Rider, he directs that. Total triumph, and uh, so, and that was that sets off that changes Hollywood. They're they're trying to now make youth films. Forget these Hello Dolly, forty million dollar musicals. Let's do these young. That's what the kids want. Let's do all that. So, Hopper takes his moment, and what does he do with it? Everybody else might have cashed in, done something different. Hopper, crazy artist, he makes a French new wave. You know, kind of his own crazy. Bite the hand, um, goes off to Peru, the legend begins, he's out of his mind, the crazy hippie has 
you know, taking Universal's money. But he makes a really interesting movie. I don't have a lot of you have seen the last movie. I, I like the last movie a lot. It's a really bold film, and it's a gutsy film for a guy to do. And it's an interesting chit to cash at that moment to make an anti-film, to make a film that indicts the audience, to, to really just punch back. I mean, it, it's it was a risky film. He did it. He won awards at Venice. You know, this film he worked on forever. It meant so much to him. And Universal just said no. Either re-edit it, or we're. You can go on YouTube and see him on the Dick Cavett show, kind of pleading, like, you know, don't, you know, go watch this film. You know, he was an artist who was just being sunk. But uh, it completed. Like Hopper was. Maybe he had the misfortune of looking a little bit like Charles Manson in the late '60s, early '70s. <laughs> but. They were sick of him. It was like, okay, you're out of here. And so he just retired to New Mexico. And he started, he kept acting. You know, he had some wonderful roles in the 70s. Uh, Vin Vendor's American Friend. Uh, Henry Jaglom's Tracks is a good leading part. Um, Apocalypse Now, obviously. He's a major part of that movie, if you think about it. But he was still out of Hollywood. He, he really couldn't get hired. Those were friends or independent international films. Coppola had the the great quote, I think, about Hopper, he says, because they're like, well, why'd you hire that madman, you know, to, and he says, well, I'm not working with Dennis for his 98% bullshit, I'm, I want his 2% genius, you know, so that's, <laughs> but the opinion was low of Hopper at this point, so it's, it's, he makes this film in 80, and here it comes, 80, it, the film's really just a rumor, and, so I am lucky enough to be in the Houston area where they are now showing Dennis Hopper in person, a Dennis Hopper retrospective at the Rice Media Center. Hopper had some Houston connections. His best, one of his best friends, Walter Hopps, the great curator who had taken over the De Manil Museum there in the 80s. He was the curator when it opened. He was old art buddies with Hopper. Rice Media Center has a connection there. They're doing an uh, exhibition of all his photography. And, and they're showing a retrospective of not only the, the two films at that point he had directed, but a lot of films he had acted in. So I'm attending these. This is April 83. And the night before the big Dennis Hopper in person presenting out of the blue his l new movie that he's directed, they're showing The American Friend, which I had never seen. So wander into the theater, probably about 25 people there, and out steps uh, Vim Vendors to introduce it. They're like, what's he doing in town? Well, he's actually scouting locations for Paris, Texas. And uh, so he's like, uh, welcome to the film. Uh, Dennis Hopper will be around later, you know. He's like, wow, Vim Vendors, he's here? You know, I'd seen a number of his films, like, so cool. And then after the film, Vendors sits down, Hopper joins them. They have a really wonderful discussion. Terry Southern's in the audience. Because Hopper and him, are, they're working on a sequel to uh, Easy Rider at that point called uh, Biker's Heaven. I have a quote I'll read you after about a description of this movie from Hopper's mouth that is unbelievable. But um, so it was a really wonderful evening. Uh, just so, you know, interactive. He's so, you know, passionate and smart talking about that movie and his career and everything. So I can't wait for the next night. You know, we show up. The following night, Dennis Hopper in person, instead of 25 people, it's 400 people. The whole theater's packed. And what happens next ends up in every book or reference you can <laughs> YouTube it. Hopper shows up that night. And I'm going to save this story till after the movie. I'll, I'll do it in the order. I'll do it in the order that it happened. We uh, sit down in the theater and he doesn't come out before. He says he's going to be there after. He's going to be there after. So we watch the movie, and then, indeed, he is thereafter, or m maybe not, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I'll tell that story after, but I'll, I'll jump to one story. I have a bookend to that story. 25 years later, 2008, I'm on a beach at the Cannes Film Festival with uh, Jeremy Thomas and Dennis Hopper. And just, you know, there's some big reception, but we've wandered down the beach a little bit. It's kind of dark, but we're talking. And... Uh, you know, I tell Hopper I was there that night that he almost killed himself. And he went off the deep end, and it's kind of famous in Hopper lore. And we were talking about that. And um, I asked him, what's it like to work with Vin Vendors again all these years later? 
um, you know, to be working with him. Is that, you know, what's that like? How, how, 25 years, that's a long time. And Hopper says, well, it is a little different because it uh, takes a drag on the joint. <laughs> I'm, I'm sober now. <laughs> he, hands it, he hands the joint off. So, anyway, that's my shorter Hopper story. I'll, uh, <laughs> we'll be around after. Okay. <laughs>
And so all the freaks, the, it was some Rice University students and myself and a few others, I guess. We get on this bus, the school bus, and we head to, to North Houston. Hopper, Vin Vendors, Terry Southern, they're all in some other car. Who knows? Who knows where we're going? This might be the last anyone hears of us. I don't know what's going on. And so, but seriously, if I had anything to do in the world, if I had a life at that point, I wouldn't have been on this trip. But, I, you know, so we end up at this racetrack in North Houston. Uh, I think they had just had the little destruction derby or the, you know, it's a Saturday night. Um, it's a bunch of rednecks, of course. And... Uh, we're just all standing there, the freaks, and then surrounded by rednecks. And uh, Hopper comes out, and he's going to do now a stunt that's called the Russian suicide chair. I think. Is that it? Yeah. And what he's done, and I think he describes it a little bit, he, or the word is out or something. It's a stunt he saw as a kid, but, and it's fitting for this movie because it's a dynamite stunt. You encircle yourself in dynamite. You light the fuse, and if they all go off, it creates a vacuum. And they apparently used it in the Russian, it was an old Russian trick when they said they were executing someone or someone was committing suicide, but they really weren't. So the officials could see them just be blown all to hell. Okay, well, they're dead, but they really weren't because there was a vacuum created if, they, if all the sticks go off. If they don't, well, you are gone, you know. The vacuum doesn't work and they'll be picking up pieces of you. Okay, so <laughs> Hopper goes out in the middle of this, in the middle of the track and there's like a little chair or table and he's lighting it and Vin Vendors is there taking pictures and people are talking. I was like, this is the weirdest fucking thing. And this one old guy, I guess he was a local, he's like, I said, oh boy, that got shot off that motorcycle and easy riding. You know, the, 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 the guy's at the track. That's that old boy. And I'm like... And then, uh, I'm like, what the fuck? And then sure enough, there's this huge explosion. I mean, just pow! And out of the ash and the smoke comes Dennis Hopper going, ah, ah. He had, like, survived some test of some kind. You know, it was... And that was the night his friend said they took him off to rehab. That was like, <laughs> he, he marks it in his thing. That was the night he got his friends together and we're gonna see him either explode or it was the end of something for Dennis. But that becomes a very significant night in his life. It's written in all his things, he talked about it openly. It's um, because um, that, he cleaned up, he really did. His career, I think something changed that night. He, he, when I, was, I hinted at the beginning, I was being kind of funny, like who had a better 80s, who started lower and ended, but you know, he was on his, from just total 60s burnout, the perception of him was so low. I mean, you see why, he was, he was kind of crazy. But uh, man, did he, he, pretty soon he's an icon. By the end of the decade, and he's, his directing career's back. He's doing colors, studio films with Sean Penn and Robert Duvall. I mean, that's a great movie. Mm -hmm. And so I just think he had such a, such a great comeback. But uh, that was Hopper at the racetrack. I mean, it was just a crazy, <laughs> I guess we got on the bus and went back. I'm like, what was that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I was there, I was there. By the way, you guys all hang around because we're gonna party out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll crank up the music. But I, I think, I really respect the way he did it though. He tested us as an audience. You yeah. know, he wanted only the people who kind of, we qualified to be there with him by sticking it out through that damn video that he had, oh God. Yeah, p people who went home early, like. Yeah, they missed it. Yeah, they, there's no, they, they missed it. There's no, there's, you, you've got to do that kind of stuff in life. Yeah. When you that get was... that opportunity once every 5,000 years <laughs> to do a thing like that. <laughs> What so, if he had died that night? I don't know. He had some stuntman he trusted who had kind of helped him set it up, but they said, no, nah, it's real dynamite. Anything can happen. Well, that's But an you know, that story. kind of apocalyptic, that says a lot about him as an artist, though. So many of his films, they have this kind of foreboding and doom. I mean, all his movies, those three movies particularly, you know, look how Easy Rider ends. Look at, you know, it wasn't, Hopper was never Age of Aquarius hippie guy. He was seen, you look at him and go, oh, there's a hippie. No, no, no. 
he was punk rock before it was punk. He was much more edgy, much had a much um, you know darker vision, I think. And he had this apparently had this incredible guilt complex about James Dean having died and he, that he hadn't died. Oh really? And he kind of carried around with him all the time. Hmm. Yeah, he talked a lot about James Dean in that on the video monitor. He was still <laughs> <laughs> he was referring to him you know more than once. So I think he was kind of. I think he took it as he was the next, you know, Dean's soul jumped into his or something. Yeah, yeah. And he was going to live that. But what an amazing, what, a, what an amazing person who walked guy. among us, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, he was, is, he's really underrated. I mean, he's a notorious character and he lived in this myth. And I don't think that helps you really. Because um, I mean, people kind of ganged up on him. He didn't deserve that for American Friend, but he he gave into it. You know, he allowed himself to be kind of portrayed that way, and he sort of rubbed it in people's faces. And his whole life was kind of like this performance art thing. Mm -hmm. But I think he's a, he's amazingly talented. I mean, he's I really like his movies as a director, and I was lucky I got to tell him that. You know, because everybody's oh hey I loved you in you know Blue Velvet and. Yeah. Whatever you know. But I was like hey I really like your movies. You know I think you're just you know, great director, I just really, you know. And when you see his movies, even like when you see like in The Trip, like he shot a lot of that stuff in Roger yeah, Corman's The Trip, it's yeah. like it's free, it's the best stuff in the movie. It's, it's, yeah, and it's all like visual, really visual. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And he really got great performances. I mean, there's such raw moments in this movie. Yeah, and the story behind this movie was yeah. that he wasn't even originally the director. The director, right. original director, just kind of like couldn't hack it, wasn't getting stuff in on time, and the producers were like, well, we got to close down the movie unless we can find a director. We can't find a director. Gosh, who could direct? And Hopper was already working as the dad, and they were just like, well, anybody but this guy, obviously. But they, you know. <laughs> apparently he hadn't um, worked yet. I read somewhere that he hadn't worked yet. He was on the movie to play the dad, and the guy sort of dropped out, or one of the exec producers, someone quit because the footage was kind of unusable, unusable. So he kind of junked all that footage, none of it, reworked the script, made a Dennis Hopper movie out of it. And it was and a Dennis a real, Hopper, Linda Mann's movie because he was oh, working yeah. with her and they like, they were like, he was like, what do you think we ought to do now, Linda? And they were, cause like she had that perspective, oh. you know? Yeah, and he's smart enough to trust that because what a great teen punk movie. I mean, I, I, at the time, I remember I, I had just seen Days of Heaven, probably not that long before this, so it was kind of, there was an incongruency to the, yeah. the, the kid in that and this. I was kind of thrown off a little bit, but uh, what a ferocious performance. Just yeah. that Linda Mance, that strut, that walk, you know. Damn. It's one of the great teen performances. It's just, she's amazing. It's surprising how it's real it is. It's, just, it's one of the first things that just jumps out. It's just yeah. how, how real it feels. Yeah, and from her perspective, too. It's just like, God, oh, these adults are so sleazy and fucked up. And yeah. The world sucks, and everything is just, oh, it's such a teen point of view. You know, so, you know, that Hopper could get that. You know, I think he was perpetually the punk, you know, himself to the very end. Well, you see it, you know, he gets fired and he runs over them, you know, you, know, you see where that comes from. Yeah, yeah. Like father, like daughter. That scene where he's running through the junkyard with like yeah. that bottle of whiskey and like the <laughs> seagulls are flying away, it's such a great scene. That, that movie's amazing. Uh, yeah, great print too. Can you believe that? There wasn't a scratch on that. It's a brand new print pretty that much. That was a great way to go. This, this 80 series has just been remarkable, the, you know, just the, that we're showing these in 35 millimeter that, you know, it's just... I'm showing so Lars many can track down a good print. If there's a good print out there, Lars will find it. It's not that hard. <laughs> the, but the uh, but we were showing a lot of movies that like they haven't like shipped out in years. Like yeah, who like you guys want to show Star Eighty? Why? Why? Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> like, but it was amazing, you know. But but they were just like almost everywhere was just surprised. It's like wait a minute, you show Reds really? There's a lot oh, of that. what a sad state of things. But but, but it's, not in Austin, Texas. But no, that's that's the way appreciate that's the way like reputations appreciate. You know, it takes time. It takes time for movies to be considered classics. Yeah, and I think Hopper will get his due as a director and as a photographer. He really check out his. At the time, I remember not being that generous. You know, I was like, uh, you know, who's this '60s guy? Oh, a bunch of photographs. Of course, everybody takes photographs. What is he? Some dilettante? You know, I remember. You know, but that, they're really great. I mean, he's he's a major artist. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and we talked about his drug use, but he was apparently really, he was just like, no, no, I was just an alcoholic. I used all the cocaine and the speed so that I could stay up and drink more. Yeah, like, that was his whole thing. <laughs> yeah. it, he was mainly, he was going to follow all that rum with 26 beers. So you've got to have a little help to yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's tough to do. Yeah. I, I think that night, 
Well, Ryan Huberman, who works at the Rice at Rice, he's a professor there, and he shot some video that is somehow available sometimes on. I just posted it on uh, Facebook, and I'll post it again tomorrow so you guys can the, see it. The explosion. You don't see. Yeah, I was looking for you in it. I, I saw you. that reason. I was looking for me too because I was kind of right by. I was like hanging. I was. I was right there. But, no. Yeah, it's, um, it's amazing. You can actually see the footage of this, and then Hopper comes out, and he's just going, "Woo!" Yeah, he's just like. <laughs> But we're like, yeah, we didn't have enough of a context to even know what he was doing. <laughs> but it meant a lot to him. You could tell. <laughs> I wonder if we have any contributions, questions, et cetera, from the audience about that amazing movie. Linda Mans. Jeez. No, nobody has a thing to say. Oh, good night, everybody. Oh, yeah, right here. <laughs> what happened to Linda Mans? I think she, um, we read some article about her. I think she's a, she's a mom. She's living where? Northeast? Yeah. It's, Kids and yeah. doesn't make movies. Yeah. Yeah, I posted her recipe for uh, clam bread. So if you guys are if you guys follow AFS viewfinders, there's like there's like I think it was like Jay Hoberman or somebody like like did an interview with her. Yeah, and, yeah. And Village Voice had an article on her a few years ago. Lewis Black. Yeah. Sent it around. That's where I got it. Yeah. But but it's her recipe for like clam bread. And it's it's just in her in her words. It's not like spelled out. So you just hear her voice by saying, and then you want to chop the bread into like little cubes, you know. So. <laughs> no, what a special talent. You just have to admire people who can work. I mean that's a really great performance, though. That's not just some reactive thing. That's like long takes, you know, yeah. in the car. Jeez. She just so embodies that. It's amazing. I like kind of the punk part. At the time, it felt a little forced to me. Again, I was young, more critical. Now that feels very real to me, that like kind of shitty punk club, the dumb stuff people are doing. You know, that's like, yeah, that, that's kind of how it was. And, and, and when yeah. you look at the punk club, it's not the like... The band's not that good. You know, it's just like, yeah, that's how most of it was. <laughs> I mean, and he not didn't fly like an X, you know, to play. Right, he right, got right. the local, you know, I don't know. Is that a band? Does anyone know this? But, yeah, I'm sure it's a real band, but, you know, it wasn't. And most of the people in the punk club, like, look like hippies still. Like, that, yeah. which is very, very authentic. And her style, yeah, it wasn't all Mohawks yeah, and yeah. things, you know. I love her Elvis obsession, too, that Elvis and punk. Or, you know, Elvis had only died a few years, three years before this, so there she is. <laughs> Yeah, anybody else has a thing that they'd like to uh, say? Yeah, I see a hand, I see a series of hands pointing at different people accusatorily. Yes, right here. <laughs> I, just, I just want to know more about that character. I mean, you know, like her character is just incredible. I mean, where, I, where did the inspiration from that come from? I mean, do you know anything more? He said, Hopper said it's like one of those articles you read on page four of some teenager freaks out stabs her dad, blows her mom, you know, just one of these domestic things. He just, he wanted to just, but where that comes from? But, the, but a lot of it's in the original script, CB, that was, it was actually going to be like a, it was one of these Canadian tax shelter movies, which is why you see like every agency of the Canadian government thanked at the end. Um, it was, you know, Canada, you could go make a movie and the government would, you know, refund yeah, there's 70 some, of your some tax shelter thing, thing yeah. where all of it was, you know, whatever. It was advantageous to do movies up there. But it was eventually called, it was originally called CB, and then when Hopper took over, of course, he totally rewrote it and changed it. But it was, it was like a story of a young girl in a fucked up family. But it, I don't think it was supposed to be that fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no way it could be that fucked up. <laughs> you can't write that. And uh, the other thing that the producer told me about this movie uh, is that half the, fully half the budget went to Raymond Burr for that movie. Uh -huh. It was in two scenes, but like they needed like a star really? that people feel comfortable with. Yeah. It's such an interesting <laughs> presence to, to have him in there all of a sudden. Yeah. You know. I guess the name Raymond Burr just really brought... <laughs> but he's creepy, too, when he asks her, oh, you can stay with me, and he puts his hand on her, like, yeah. oh, that doesn't, don't do that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> All adults suspect in this one, I think. Adults are... This, this movie reminds me how horrible adults are. I know. <laughs> oh, they're so fucked up. I know. Right over here, yeah. Okay, so this one's, like, kind of a dumb question. Um, but, uh, so, watching movies, uh, I always notice films that have a lot of red and blue. And then I noticed, like, you know, like, red is a really cinematic color. And it feels kind of stupid asking this because it's called out of blue. But I noticed so much red and blue and yellow. And I was just wondering if you thought, did this have a color palette, do you think? Or 
is that just sort of like those colors are cinematic, so hmm. they look good. Or a lot of blue jeans. I don't know. I'm sure it did have a color palette. You know, that's the kind of thing you do. You know, you have to make choices, costumes, what color the walls. You know. It's a thing you would say. It's hard to imagine Hopper at this point going around going, okay, yeah, give me the curtains paint that wall. Man, yeah. but we need to paint the wall, man. No, maybe it was just a blue era. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Blue and red. At the same time, though, there's so much. You know, like you see this, like, you know, she's wearing this dress, and then there's yellow. I mean, all tractors are yellow or whatever. You know, just like splashes of yellow. Um, I don't, I don't know. I guess the answer is that you don't know and maybe Hopper didn't care. She <laughs> makes the girl's okay. face blue with her <laughs> ice cream. I think there was some thought as to what color. I sure, I sure wish we could ask Dennis Hopper. I, I miss I that guy. I that know. guy was great. He was the great survivor. I remember seeing him on a talk show, probably by the late 80s. Dennis Hopper, icon, survivor. You know, he, he gained almost like, he was like a film Keith Richards or something like Dennis Hopper's still alive and he's great. It, you know, people were like proud of him or, you know, he was this icon. But he'd be in mid conversation, he'd be on like the Tonight Show or something. He'd just look around and go, man, it's great to be alive. You know, he just, <laughs> just non sequitur, you know, just like, but he really meant it. You know, he meant like, wow, I'm here and I'm kind of appreciative. <laughs> He was like this. He became like kind of this holy beast, you know, kind of guy, yeah. like one of the, like this Hunter Thompson sort of guy. Like, oh, those guys that survived, you know, it's like they've been through it and they've mm -hmm. attained a, a higher spiritual level through, for it. But like Keith Richards, sober, yeah, the whole last part of the career, they kind of live. You think they're a freak, but they're, you know, or sober from the alcohol, I guess. As right. I found them. But um, so um, but an an icon. I think it's. I, th I think when we look at like a director, like I think I think for a lot of people when they kind of become like cinephile, self-identified cinephiles, like they're really identifying primarily with like you know the Stanley Kubricks and the Scorseses, and the people are very mm -hmm. specific. You know when they land their camera like on a dime. But I think it's so important to also like equally value the work of like sloppy filmmakers, filmmakers who who are not a hundred percent precise, filmmakers who have shaggy edges. Well, I think. You know, a lot of people would put Cassavetes in that thing. Sure. And similar, an actor who's making a film, what's his priority? Not all, but it's, he's going to get something real on the screen. And Cassavetes and Hopper do that, come hell. I mean, he, he's going to go with the imperfection of the camera and the real emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to err on that side where a Kubrick would never do it. You know, like the precision and, you know, control. So... Yeah, I think it's so important to celebrate that side of it too, that sloppy sort of shaggy side of it as well, because that's that's also a major source of the truth that we get from film. Yeah, I think that was his priority. But um, oh, do you want to hear his description of biker heaven? Please. Uh, this is what he, he he was doing interviews at this time in '83 about they really were going to make an Easy Rider sequel. So, and Terry Southern, the great Terry Southern, who worked on Easy Rider with him. Co-wrote Doctor Strangelove. You know, he was just the guy. Texas boy. Yeah. You know, and Hopper spent a lot of time in Texas. He was here in Austin in the '80s. He did uh, part of his comeback in the acting world before Blue Velvet and Hoosiers and Over the Edge. And you know, he caught that wave in the second part of the '80s. But he was in Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. Mm -hmm. Toby Hooper. He's kind of the one of the leads in that. And uh, he celebrated his. I remember um, visiting the set. Not this night, but. He celebrated his 50th birthday on the set here in Austin. And he was back a few years later shooting The Hot Spot, the Don Johnson. That was a film he made after Colors. So he was all, he, he liked Texas. He was always around, had a lot of friends. Yeah. Okay, so here's his quick description um, in an interview thing. He said, it takes place 100 years after the nuclear <laughs> holocaust, of course, and the earth is inhabited only by bike gangs. <laughs> lesbian moon cults who haven't seen the moon in years because of the radiation. They worship the moon and eat men. <laughs> there, are, there are cannibal cops who have sawed off teeth. <laughs> there are all these mutant bike gangs and this guy on a golden Harley comes down and gets Peter and me out of this swamp. Remember, and last we saw them they were pretty dead in Louisiana or whatever, but uh, they resurrected I guess. <laughs> he gives us new bikes, new clothes, some atomic weed, and, and he gives Peter the don't tread on me flag. Our task is to go find the president and restore the country. A real, always a patriot, 
you know. Um, so we end up we end up at the Lincoln Memorial, and Peter's dying in my arms, and I'm reciting the Gettysburg Address. It's all very crazy. <laughs> then he makes really clear. But in this film, as opposed to Easy Rider, uh, clear, you know. We don't let people fuck around with us. We don't let people kick us out of restaurants and push us around because this is no push around world. We're serious. So he was kind of enacting some revenge, I think, on that one. But anyway, that's, that film never got made, but it would have, I don't know, it sounds like it would have been interesting. I would have gone. A little bigger budget, for that. maybe. Bigger budget, I think. Sounds like. To, it. Than the original Easy Rider. <laughs> Well, uh, we don't have a movie next week because the series is over uh, for now until we decide to come back and do the next few years. But I, I did want to thank all of you that have come for uh, most or all of them. Anybody here come for most of all or all of them? So, yeah, who raise was your hand. Ten yeah. or more times, the hardcores. Yeah, who are the really hard? You get to get on the bus with us. After. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you. No. Uh, and thank uh, my employer, Austin Film Society, and really especially for all the great times that we've had and all the great things we've learned. Thank you, Rick Linkley. Oh, well. This has been fun. It's so fun. This is what the Film Society has always been about, getting a bunch of us together to watch movies together. And it's just, it's been really fun for me to, you know, this thing's a very personal trip for me back to these films that hit me at a really important time in my own life and I, it's fun to watch them with people who haven't necessarily seen them you know some of the some of the or seen them again like me you know for after all these years so the 80s a lot of great movies in the 80s you know i mean we make our title for this series is a bit of a joke i mean we're kind of serious you're right hollywood was getting bad yeah but there's never a bad year for film. There's there's just too many good films being made. And if you want, uh, we have a we posted a summer viewing list. If you want to really catch it, we did only this is the first part of the '80s. We scratched the surface. There's so many great films, and um, just there's a lot of suggestions on this list. If you want to go, um, so so follow I, some threads. What he's talking about is many of you know already. There's a, a on if you get on the Facebook on your computer which you have to have electricity for, so but just get, get on that. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a page called AFS Viewfinders, and it's where a lot of us kind of have our conversations about movies, and we argue, and I'll say, oh, this movie was so bad, and then you say, oh, no, it wasn't, it was good. Uh, things like that. But anyway, I posted a whole list of the movies that we didn't play in this series, which is like, I don't know, like, it, this is Rick's list of like, our 50 titles or something, yeah, that like, you absolutely a gotta go watch next. Completist. And a lot of them you've probably seen, but there's some in there maybe you should have seen and haven't, so it's a little kick to go, yeah, I really, damn it, I, I do need to see that. So This is like that summer, they probably don't do this anymore, but when I was a kid, like when you were going to summer vacation, your teacher would say, here's a summer reading list of books that you could read if you want to. <laughs> Which nobody ever read, read them. probably, yeah. But but this is this is one of but those. This is, yeah, yeah. But it's in the spirit of this series. You know, a lot of th times, you know, it was like maybe there wasn't a print, or maybe they're the rights holder. You know, it's kind of it's not arbitrary. This is curated, but it's there's still a lot of factors that go into being able to show a film here. Yeah. So yeah, there are a number of them that we couldn't just couldn't find prints for, or couldn't get the rights for, or anything. So. You can go and watch them. Most of them are out on DVD or the VHS. You can get them at Balkan Video or I Love Video. So anyway. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll start the series up again. We'll 84, 5, and 6. It starts getting, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. There'll be some amazing stuff. All right, and thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been great. Thank you, Rick.